Well, we're going to come to look at God's word. So we're in, in Mark's gospel today, and we're looking at the parable of the growing seed in Mark 4, 26 to 29. And uh, as we look at uh, this parable, let me just give you a little bit of background to it so you can kind of picture what's going on, because I always think it's, it's useful to have in your mind uh, you know, an idea of, of the setting. So I want you to um, imagine now um, that you're sitting beside the Sea of Galilee. Uh, you're on the sand on the shore. Um, Jesus is sitting in a boat um, a few meters out into the water. Um, the waves are um, splashing up against, uh, against the shore there. Um, it's probably um, the middle of the day uh, and uh, possibly the afternoon. Uh, and, uh, and, and maybe a little bit sort of later in the afternoon, so the, the sun isn't at its absolute full strength. And Jesus is in full flow teaching the people. There's a great crowd that have gathered around him. That's why he's in the boats, because there are so many. And sometimes Jesus took that advantage of uh, when he was by Galilee and the crowds were pushing around him that he would get in the boat. And that seems to have been uh, one of his ways of, uh, uh, of coping in those situations. It's the second year of Jesus' ministry. Um, he's uh, now appointed the 12 apostles, so um, they've been followers of him almost from the beginning, really, or most of them at different times they've joined. And in the second year, he actually goes up on the mountain, spends some time with his heavenly Father, comes down, and then it says that he appointed 12 of the disciples to be apostles. That has now happened in chapter 3. And uh, so now we move on. Uh, to Jesus teaching the crowds um, uh, in this way. And uh, as he's teaching them, uh, Mark tells us that he used a number of parables and that he spoke many things in parables to them. And here, in fact, Mark gives us four examples of the parables that Jesus used. Now, that does not mean to say that at this particular instance, Jesus only used four parables. He may have used many, many parables, but Mark picks out four of them and uh, gives these four parables. So the first one is the parable of the sower. These are all in chapter 4, incidentally. Um, so the parable of the sower. And then he gives the parable of a lamp on a stand. Then the one we're looking at today, the growing seed, and then finally the parable of the mustard seed. And so you'll see that three out of the four that, uh, examples that Mark gives us are agrarian, they're to do with agriculture, and the other one is domestic, and yet all of these would have been very familiar uh, scenes. Uh, they would have all understood them. These were from everyday life. Jesus was picking examples that they understood and trying to liken, actually, in each case, this is what the kingdom of God is like. And he's trying to explain that to them, to give them a picture. Uh, you understand the kingdom on earth. I want to explain to you about the kingdom of God. And there's a good reason why Jesus is doing that, because they have got a false picture of what the kingdom of God is going to be like. And they've been taught this. This is what the Jews were teaching their people uh, from a very early age. They were always looking forward to the kingdom of God coming. That wasn't news to them at all. The fact that Jesus is coming, uh, saying the kingdom of God is here, that it's coming, that's not news. The news, well, perhaps the kingdom of God is here. That might have been news. But the kingdom of God is coming. That is definitely not news to them. But what is, is the form of the kingdom. See, they were expecting this great, mighty, powerful leader to come in who was going to overthrow all the tyrants who were holding them down. And so in this case, it was the Romans. And when he overthrew the Romans, that he would then uh, ride magnificently into Jerusalem, triumphantly, with great pomp and ceremony, and uh, he would enter into the temple courts and he would establish his royal throne there in Jerusalem. Uh, and from that place, not only would he rule Israel, but how about this, that he was going to conquer the whole world. So yes, he was going to not just overthrow the Romans from Israel, 
but he was going to take over their whole kingdom. And the Roman kingdom was huge. It was the biggest kingdom the earth had known at that stage. And there had been some pretty powerful kingdoms that had come in the past. And at various times, they had oppressed Israel. And every time one of those kingdoms comes and oppresses Israel, the hope was that God would send the Savior who would come, the Messiah, who would overthrow the nations. So whether it was Egypt and the oppression, you remember that Egypt took Israel, they were the first ones to oppress them into slavery. And God delivered them out of that. He sent them a saviour in the form of Moses, not the saviour, but a saviour, someone to come and rescue them. But later on, there were other nations as well that came along, oppressed them, took them over, whether it was the Assyrians. And the Assyrians actually took part of God's people, part of Israel, and they were never seen again. Then there were the Babylonians, and the Babylonians came in and they oppressed as well. And they tried to destroy God's people. And they carried them off into captivity at the time of Daniel. And Jeremiah and such like. They were trying to destroy God's people. And then, of course, after uh, those and, and the Medes and the Persians, etc., all linked to the Babylonians, the next great empire was the Greeks. And we don't see so much of the Greeks because the Greeks kind of appeared in the intertestamental period, if you can get your tongue around that word. Um, the intertestamental period is the period between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. You've got these 400 silent years, we call them. And in that time, the Greeks came along and they were an incredibly powerful uh, force. Again, the world had never seen anything quite as powerful as the Greeks with each subsequent kingdom, they're getting a bit more powerful. And so the Greeks came in, and uh, there was one um, uh, Greek king in particular, after Alexander the Great, I don't, know, I don't want to bore you with the history, but the Greek kingdom got divided into four. And uh, one of the kings that came subsequent to Alexander the Great was uh, a guy called Antiochus the Fourth, Antiochus Epiphanes the bright, shining, dazzling one. That's what Epiphanes means. And he came into Jerusalem, and uh, I think it was about 168 BC. He uh, overthrew the Jews, threw them out of their temple, and then he sacrificed pig on the altar. The ultimate insult to the Jewish people and his God, that he sacrificed a pig on the altar. And uh, he was very oppressive to the Jewish people and tried to get rid of them. Then, of course, after the Greeks, the Romans came and the Romans again uh, oppressed God's people. And a little bit after what we're looking at today in Mark's Gospel, a few decades later in AD 70, the Romans came in and they destroyed Jerusalem they raised it to the ground, they burnt the temple, they knocked every stone off each other, just as Jesus said they, they would. He said, not one stone will remain on another. And you see, what is happening here is that there is a spiritual warfare that is taking place, and the spiritual warfare is ultimately trying to extinguish the light, to take out of history the Jews. Because if the Jews can be taken out and completely wiped out of history, then God's plan of salvation is finished. Because God promised the Jews that they would be a powerful nation. God promised them that they would be an eternal nation. God promised them that he would raise them up again, that they would sink down for a while because of uh, the injustice and the idol worship and the terrible sins they committed, but God says, I will not remove my love from you forever and that I will restore you. And you'll see that throughout history, even once we get out of biblical times, throughout history, various nations over the years have oppressed the Jews. 
The most famous in more recent times, of course, being Adolf Hitler, who managed to get six million of them through the gas chambers. But he could not wipe them out entirely. And what has happened is that, that at various times, various people have been raised up and empowered by Satan himself to destroy God's people. But the promise is eternal to God's people. They will never be destroyed. And ultimately, believe it or not, they are going to become the Jews. Israel will become God's greatest evangelists. How about that? They're going to be proclaiming Jesus to the nations. Isn't that amazing? That one day they will come back to him. One day they will see that Jesus is their Messiah. And one day they will proclaim Jesus to the nations around. Now, at this present time, Jesus has already told his people that you rejected me. He says to them, you didn't want to know about me at all. Therefore, he says, I'm going to take what was given to you and I'm giving it to others. And that was a reference to the Gentiles. And so the Gentile nations received. We looked at that a little bit last week. And so the people like you and me who are non-Jews, we are then entrusted with the gospel message. It has been given to us. Um, we are now recipients um, along with God's chosen people uh, to receive the grace that we do not deserve. The eternal life that shouldn't be ours. The mercy of God that should be his anger and his wrath. And Jesus is explaining now to his people, this is what the kingdom of God is like. Let me tell you all about it. Because this kingdom is an eternal kingdom. It will never end. But it's not what you think it is, he's saying to them. It's not going to be won through military might. It's going to be won through Jesus and through him alone. He is the one who bears the sword in his mouth. He is the one who wages war against the enemy, not us. It's interesting, isn't it, that even in Ephesians chapter 6, we have that wonderful chapter of the armor of God and you know, put the armor on. And then what does he say? Once you've got the armor of God on and you're fully clad in all this, this, this armor, and okay, it's modeled on a probably a Roman-style soldier, but you get the picture even today that you're protected in every way. You've, you've got you know, everything, the helmet, the breastplate, etc., the belt, the sword, the shield. You know, you're there ready. And what do soldiers do in battle scenes when they're all ready for war? They attack. But actually at that point in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, and when you've done everything, stand. He says, I'm not asking you to advance. I'm not asking you to wage war. I'm not asking you to attack. I'm asking you to stand. Stand firm. Stand firm. Don't go on your own. Don't be a maverick. You stand firm. That's what your armor is for. The one who attacks is Jesus himself. You see, there is nothing that you can do no weapon that you possess that will make any great difference. The only weapon is the cross. Jesus had to do it. Not you, not me. He does it for us. Then he protects us. He gets us all ready so that when the fiery darts of the evil one come, we are ready and waiting. Now, let's have a look a little bit more at this passage here. So you're on the seashore, Jesus is in the boat, he's giving these parables, and the first parable he gives is the parable of the sower. Why do I mention that when we're supposed to be looking at the parable of the growing sea? I think it's really important just to touch on this for a moment, because the parable of the sower is the paradigm of parables. What do I mean by that? This is the model 
And if you understand this parable, Jesus himself said, then you'll understand all the parables. If you don't understand this parable, he says to his disciples, you won't understand the rest. And so what he does here is he gives the parable of the sower to the crowd. And then we find that in verse 10, um, it says that when Jesus was alone, the 12 uh, and uh, the others around him asked him, about the parable. So this is now the closest followers. Uh, after they finished at the seaside uh, on, on the shore, they've gone back home, they're in the house, they're sitting down or wherever, uh, and they said to him, Jesus, tell us about the parable of the sower. Explain it to us. And you'll find that the other gospels often, uh, most of them I think, if not all, uh, they give an explanation of the parable of the sower. Now that's very unusual. You don't get explanations for many of the parables. And here Jesus gives the explanation. And so it's almost in parenthesis, it's almost an aside that Jesus does from verse 10 um, uh, through to, to, to verse 20, as he's saying, and then later on, this is what they asked, and this is what Jesus told them. And then in verse 21, we're back on the seashore again. And so we're back there. It's not a different occasion. It's still the same occasion. It's still the same day. Um, but we're back there. Because now Mark has done what he needs to do in explaining the parable of the sower. So that all those who read about it can understand it. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into the parable of the sower today because that's not our main purpose. But I'm guessing that most of us probably have read the parable of the sower enough. Uh, and if you uh, are unaware of that, I encourage you to go back and read that later and the explanation that came with it. But essentially, we have a seed, the same seed. We looked at this the other week, which is one of the reasons I'm not going into it in great detail. But we have a seed that is scattered. It's the same seed. And the seed lands in different types of soil. And the different types of soil represent different types of heart. But the seed is the word of God, the gospel message. And as it lands um, in the hard soil, uh, it doesn't do very well. If it lands in the weedy, thorny soil, it doesn't do well. Um, uh, if it lands uh, in the stony soil, it doesn't do well. When it lands in the good soil, then it produces the crop 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. And so he's saying that the word of God, if it lands in the right heart, it will produce an incredible harvest. That's what the kingdom of God is like. And now he says, if you understand what we're talking about with the kingdom of God here, you can apply the principles, not necessarily the exact metaphors, but the principles so that you can understand the other parables too. So the light on the lamp, so it doesn't matter whether it's a seed going into the soil or a light that's put out to shine. The purpose of the seed, what does the seed exist for? The seed exists to be sown and to reproduce. Why does the light exist? The light exists to shine. And so must the gospel. And now we come to more agricultural scenes once again. And say, and we're looking uh, specifically um, at the growing seed. The mustard seed, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to touch on that because I'm going to steal the thunder from another week. Um, and we've got some good things to see when we look at the mustard seed um, shortly. Um, there's some, some really good stuff in there. But let's look then at the growing seed. Simple parable Jesus tells. The kingdom of God is like. That's the first thing we need to note. He's still telling us, still trying to explain to us, still give us the picture of what the kingdom is all about. Get rid of the pictures that you've got in your mind, he says to them, of this great military leader who's coming in to overthrow. He says, this is the kingdom of God. And so he says, a man scatters seed on the ground. Simple. He's broadcasting the seed. He's going and taking handfuls of it from his sack, which will be over his shoulder, and he throws it out, and he just scatters it across the, sea, uh, across the soil. And we saw from the parable of the sower that sometimes the seed lands in good soil and sometimes not such good soil. Sometimes the birds come and peck it up. 
and uh, sometimes it gets crushed underfoot. But a certain amount of that seed, and obviously the, the sower is aiming to get the seed more or less into the good soil, but you know, when you're just kind of broadcasting it, handfuls of seed at a time, uh, you know, it doesn't always land in the place you want it to go. But let's just assume that the seed here is landing in the good soil. Okay, we're not interested in the, the path, the stony soil and, and all that now. This is the seed that's landed in the good soil. It's gone down into it. It's receiving the nourishment, the nutrition from the soil that it needs. It's getting the moisture that it requires as well in order to, to grow. And he says, this is what then happens about the farmer, the man who scattered the seed. He goes to bed. And when he goes to bed, Jesus says, does the seed stop growing? Does the seed go to bed also? Does the seed only do anything when the farmer is out there encouraging it? I don't know whether you've ever found anybody who talks to plants. I used to know somebody who used to regularly talk to his plants and he was absolutely convinced that the more he talked to them, the better they did. Um, I'm not so convinced. Um, but there are people who believe that, you know, talking and encouraging your plants uh, uh, in that way helps them along. I think you can do other things to help them along, but uh, I'm not so sure about um, you know, having a, a conversation with your plants, no matter how nice you are to them. Uh, what lovely, encouraging words you say, uh, I'm not sure that it works. And Jesus is saying the same thing, really, that... Once the seed is in the ground, and bearing in mind that we're talking here not so much somebody planting a few seeds in a pot and watching them grow on the windowsill. Uh, if you've ever done that, you know that you can spend a bit more time, can't you, in dedication on it. This guy has got a whole field sown. Uh, he's growing uh, enough wheat to get, the core, uh, to get the flour that he needs for the bread. This is not talking about, you know, two or three plants. We're talking thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of seeds that are being sown. And as he goes out casting these seeds all over and the seeds landing in the soil, um, his work is more or less done. He can't even water it. I mean, the field is too big. I mean, can you imagine how much it would take to go and water? I mean, sometimes uh, in the summer I might... Uh, uh, have a moment of um, uh, mercy on my garden and decide to go and get the watering can uh, and just say it's been a hot few days or whatever things are drying out a bit I might just get the watering can and, and just never bother with a hose pipe but the watering can and to be honest by the time you know I've watered several pots and raised beds and everything you know it, it's amazing how much time goes and just filling up one watering can after another and just going around. It's those times I think maybe I should get a hose pipe. But the point is that if he was going to water his whole field, can you imagine how long it would take? Firstly, he doesn't just have a tap that he turns on to do it. That's not an option. He'd have to draw water from a well. Secondly, the water in the well is very precious. This is a hot country. And so they wouldn't want to use good water on just putting it on the ground. So the seed is left to the mercy of the elements. That's why it was important to plant the seed at the right time in the hope that it would receive the spring rains at the right time. And so as the rains come, the rains would do the watering for the farmer instead. And what is happening here is that the man now is just watching it day after day. He's going out and he might look over his field and he's probably getting uh, you know, a little bit excited when he sees the first blades begin to come through the soil. And then they grow a little bit more and a little bit more and they become like tufts of grass and then they become very long bits of grass and finally you get this little stalk that shoots up from it which develops the little ears of corn and they get fuller and fuller and but it's still green at this stage and then he waits as it comes into the height of the summer 
for the full ripening to appear. And he's getting more and more excited at this stage because um, it, it's turning that lovely golden color that he's looking for. And, and it's when it reaches that point, when it's finally, the plant essentially is, is almost dried out, really. Um, but it's fully matured that he takes the sickle to it and harvest begins. And Jesus says, this is a picture of the kingdom of God. The seed is sown. So what is the seed? The seed is still the word of God. The seed goes out. It is broadcast far and wide. It lands in the soils and some of it into good soil. But what do you do? What can you do with that seed? Well, you can try anything and everything you like, but the point is what Jesus is saying is that actually there is nothing you can do to make the seed grow. In fact, he says it's a mystery. The farmer doesn't understand. It's a, a little miracle. And I, I'm not sure where we've got to really on um, the biology of plants. I, I'm not a, anything uh, like qualified to speak on this, but as far as I know, for most of us, if not for everybody, there is still a certain amount of mystery that surrounds the germination of a seed. Why does the seed grow? Why? What makes it grow? What, what is that energy inside it that from that tiny little seed it can grow into such a wonderful plant? How does it happen? Well, that's because God has put the spark of life inside of it. And for it to germinate and grow and become the plant that it needs to be. And eventually the harvest that needs to be taken from it. And you see, that's the kingdom of God. Oh yeah, we try all sorts of things. And sometimes we even kid ourselves that it was us, that we were the ones involved in making the seed fruitful and productive. The truth is that you and I have absolutely nothing to do with it. It doesn't matter how great a sermon I preach. It doesn't matter how rousing it is. It doesn't matter how much it gets into your head and into your heart. If it's of me, nothing is going to happen whatsoever. You can even read the Bible from cover to cover once a week if you want to. And it will have no effect on you whatsoever unless God is at work. You can sit down and talk with somebody and reason with them. And I've done that with so many people over the years and some of them constantly coming back. Not just one-off conversations, but coming back again and again. And I sit down and I, and I talk with them and we go over the same things and explain the same truths of the gospel message. And still I, I come away wondering, how is it that this person has not believed? Did I not clearly state the gospel? Did I not show it as accurately as I should have done? Well, the truth is it doesn't matter how accurately I show it. The point is that it's not of me, it's of God. And that is why God is able to take the foolishness of what is preached, Paul says, the foolishness of preaching, even though it makes no sense to a lot of people. It is utter foolishness. And he says, and he turns it around to produce the harvest, to germinate a seed inside of them. You see, it's a combination of the seed, the word, that goes into that soil. And then it needs the watering which we could say is the Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit comes upon that seed and the moisture from the Spirit, the watering of the Spirit, brings it to life and regeneration occurs. It's nothing that I've done. It's nothing that you've done. So why is it then? Why is it that there are some people who uh, seem to have more success in bringing people to Christ than others. 
Why is it that there are certain churches that seem to see more people coming to faith than other churches? Why is it that there are some people who seem to explain the gospel so well that people respond at the end of it? Again, it's nothing to do with that individual or that church or the way in which the sermon's preached. It's got nothing to do with that. What it has to do with is how many seeds are you sowing? Now, I know that God uses individuals, but when he does so, that's God working through them. That's God at work. That's not the individual. And when God chooses to use a person as his mouthpiece, say, great things can happen. Sometimes God uses a particular church and they seem to see a lot of people coming to faith. But usually you find those churches that see a lot of people come to faith are the churches that are sowing the most seed. You know, there's this kind of a, you know, the law of averages here, isn't there? The more seed you sow, the more likely you are that you're going to get some kind of a harvest out of it. If you want to sow one or two seeds, don't be surprised if one or two seeds fail. If you want to sow thousands of seeds, don't be surprised if at least some of them germinate and come good. So we need to be sowing lots of seeds. And the farmer here who's sowing it, the man who's sowing the seed, who is he? I mean, you could look at that and say, well, that's God himself. Yeah, it could be. But by the same token, it could also be a picture of people like you and me. I don't think it's God, to be honest. I'll tell you why. Because when God sows the seed, he doesn't go to bed afterwards and sleep. Jesus doesn't say, right, that's it. I've finished my work here on earth. I've sown the seeds. I'm going back to heaven for a good rest before I have to come back again at harvest time. Jesus is not in heaven in bed. He's sitting on a throne. And the reason he's on a throne is because he's got work to do. He's ruling No, it's people like you and me. We're the ones sowing the seed. And we're the ones then who go to bed. And I'm kind of thankful for that. Not because I like my bed, but because I know that there is no onus and responsibility directly on me of how much the seed produces. Ultimately, you see, I'm released from that responsibility. And God says, that's my department. I'm the one who deals with the seed. I'm the one who makes it grow. I'm the one who sees it come through to full harvest. I'm the one who waters it and feeds it. I'm the one. But there's also a harvest. If you've ever tried harvesting something before it's time, you know what a mistake it is. I used to have an apple tree uh, in my garden, and uh, in it, um, in its branches, I used to hang uh, some pots, okay, some uh, hanging pots full of trailing cherry tomatoes. And uh, the tomatoes kind of got the benefit of being too high off the ground for the slugs to get, Um, And because they were trailing ones, they used to come over the side and hang down. They were a nice, easy place for me to pick, um, and uh, everything was absolutely fine. And one day, a a friend arrived uh, with his 18-month-old daughter, and uh, we were out walking in the garden. And suddenly, she sees all of the tomatoes growing in my uh, hanging pots. And uh, she's reaching out, trying to grab one of the tomatoes as she passes by. And she latches on to a lovely big green tomato. And I said to her, you won't like that one. So why don't you take a red one? No way. She's not having a red tomato. She wants a green one. And when her dad tried to persuade her, I think you'll like the red ones much better. No, no. She's having a green tomato. And she plucked the green tomato off of my plant and then proceeded to sink her teeth into it. 
I wish I had a camera for the face that she pulled. <laughs> if you try and harvest at the wrong time, you're going to end up with something that's really sour. If you harvest at the right time, you're going to end up with something that's wonderful and sweet and tasty and juicy and, and everything else. And you see, the thing is that some of us are out there trying to harvest at the wrong time. Before the seed has done its work properly and the plant is ready. And we're out there trying to bring that harvest in. And you know, it, it, it doesn't work because actually you end up wasting the harvest. It's not ready. It's useless. It, it can't be used for anything. And I think that's what some of us do. You know, we kind of see someone in whom a seed has started to germinate, perhaps. And what do we do? We try to harvest that seed. What do I mean by that? We push somebody. We push them to the point of saying, you know, you need to accept Christ. You need to do it now. But is it the right time? And so many occasions I've seen that happen, and someone has been pushed into the point of committing their lives to Christ, and clearly the seed has not finished its work. The harvest is not ready. And it's not long before you realize that that profession of faith was not genuine. So be patient. I'm not saying we shouldn't sometimes challenge people with the claims of Christ. Absolutely not. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that sometimes, you know, that, that, that we need to uh, help people over that last little step. But, you know, what you need to do is to pray. Pray hard that God will give you discernment to know and to understand when the harvest is ready. A skillful farmer will not put the sickle to the wheat until he knows it's the right time. You need to be skillful in this to understand when the right time is. And in the meantime, just keep on sowing seed and more seed and over sow it. I mean, it doesn't matter how many times you over sow the seed. Just keep sowing just in case. But there will come a time in many cases where the harvest will be ready. And let me tell you again, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. He's the one who says, now is the time. He's the one who says, this is the point at which we're ready. I was actually just listening to an evangelist last night on YouTube, and, uh, and I had to smile to myself because uh, he had this young man and uh, a student and he was explaining the gospel, and he explained it really well. I mean, this, this guy, he, he just does it so well. I, I wish I had the same uh, uh, way of being able to explain things so simply uh, and so persuasively. But remember, it's actually not about how persuasive we are ultimately. But nevertheless, I was just listening to him in this particular situation. And he gets to the point, he says to the young man, you know, he says, he says but before having explained everything to him of, of what it's like to live the Christian life. And he says, but before you need that, he says, you have to take a first step. And that first step is to commit your life 100% to Christ, to turn away from your sin, to confess that to him, um, to repent of that, and to say, from now on, I belong to Jesus, and I'm going to follow him and only him. And the guy says, yeah, right, I'll do that. And the guy's carrying on, he's explaining it. And the guy says, yeah, he says, I want to do that. And suddenly, I think the evangelist realized what he just said. I think he's so used to, you know, just, just kind of uh, the, 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 the attitude of, of, of just kind of nodding and agreeing and saying the right thing. But this guy was clearly sincere. And the evangelist kind of says to him, he says, really? You actually want to do that right now? And the guy says, yeah. He says, I really want to do that now. He says, are you serious? You're not just kidding me, are you? No, he says, I want to do it right now. You know, and, and I just love, in a sense, the surprise uh, of that. But on the other hand, I think to myself, 
You know, that wasn't just the work of one evangelist having a chance, if you can call it that, meeting. Uh, an incidental meeting with one young man at a student campus. I suspect that the Lord had been working in his heart for a long time. But the harvest was ready. And the point is that we need to also be ready. The, the sickle, if you like, has to be sharp and at hand. So that when we come to those moments where the person says, I want to take that step. I want to follow Jesus. That we're ready and prepared and know what to do. If somebody came to you today, tomorrow, anyone, caught you off guard a little bit and said, tell me how to be saved, would you know what to do? Would you honestly know how to do it? I remember challenging some others uh, once before on that and one young guy shouted out, he says, yeah, he says, I know what to do. I'll send them to you. <laughs> you don't need to send them to me. <laughs> you also have that ability, if you know Christ, to say, this is him. Let me take you to the one. You know, you've got to be like Andrew taking his brother Peter to Jesus. That's the kind of idea that we need. And you've got to know some basics about how to do that. And don't think that just by leading them in some kind of sinner's prayer is enough. I suspect that the, the vast majority of people who've been led to Christ by saying a sinner's prayer and then told, now you are, now you're saved, are not saved at all. See, the thing about being saved is there needs to be evidence, a fruit that proves that salvation. And if that's not there, I doubt very much the person was saved. It's not a case of saying, I've ticked the box, let's move on. It's about saying, I'm ready to start. I'm ready to begin learning. I'm ready to fall flat on my face, because that's going to happen too, and have to be picked up and dusted down again. And that person needs help. You know, one of the things that, that really struck me just recently, was um, uh, I was talking to somebody about um, a, a, a group, an organization, and uh, just asking how things were going. And the person said to me that, that there have been three people, I think it was, that have been led to Christ in recent times through their work and ministry. And so I said, that's absolutely fantastic. Now tell me, what's the procedure what do you do once you lead somebody to Christ through your organization? Well, there's nothing actually in place. There's no plan. There's no, and I said to him, are you honestly telling me that you will lead someone to Christ on the street and then just let them go and just hope that they're going to be all right? We are not turtles. We do not lay eggs and just abandon them in the sand and hope that they make it to the water safely. If we were to take babies, human babies that have just been given birth, put them on the street and say, they'll be all right, they can fend for themselves. They would lock us up if we did that. So why do we do that with baby Christians? See, the thing is that we need to know, we need to learn, and we need to be sure about how we help people to develop and grow into strong, healthy Christians themselves. So you need to know how to lead them to Christ, but you also need to know then how to encourage them and disciple them and to take them on. And quite frankly, if, if you're still young and a baby in your own faith, you will never take people on to maturity. You need to learn and to, to, to grow yourself so that you can say, I can take you forward to a place where I've already been. I want to bring this to a close because our time has gone, really. But I just want you to see that 
And the main thing I want you to take away from here is that whatever we do for the gospel, whatever we do, it's nothing. We just scatter seed, that's all. And then come back for the harvest. We're involved in that too. But everything in between is God's work. Paul, speaking to the Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 3, tells them, he says, that I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. Let's never forget it's his work, not ours. I just want to say to you today that there may be some of you here who, who know that the seed has been growing. And perhaps even some have been led to think that the harvest has taken place, that you've been reaped for the kingdom of God. But that may not actually be true. And maybe you know that. But I want to ask the question, has the seed finished its work? in your life are you ready to come into the kingdom because if that time is now don't leave it I know it's not in the parable but there is something that happens to ripe fruit if it's left for too long it rots don't leave it too long until it's too late Let's pray.